Okay, so this video is going to be a little continuation of what I talked about last time on um, arc length parameterizations. And uh, what we established in the last video is that um, there's, get, for any given, you know, smooth, sufficiently smooth curve, there's a parameterization of the curve such that the derivative with respect to the, that parameter produces a unit tangent vector. And so um, it may be sort of curious why we actually care about such a parameterization. And so this video is going to start uh, a discussion of sort of why we like unit tangent vectors as opposed to just general tangent vectors. And so um, the main reason that we like unit vectors is because when you differentiate a unit vector, the, the result is purely a result about the rate of change of direction of the, of the vector, right? Because um, you can think of unit, unit vectors as living on a sphere, right? The, the, one, uh, the one sphere, or sorry, the, the, the two sphere with uh, unit radius, right? So we've got our sphere. And if your vector has unit radius, or sorry, unit length, then it lives on this two sphere of unit radius. And so you can think of this thing as just sort of tracing out some curve on this sphere. And <clears throat> what we notice is that when we differentiate this thing, so suppose we have, you know, this is some function g of g of s is just a unit vector on the sphere, then the derivative of this thing is going to be a tangent vector to the sphere, okay? And it's going to point in the direction that the tangent vector, uh, sorry, that, that the unit vector is um, moving in. And furthermore, the length of this tangent vector is going to be the rate at which this um, unit vector is tracing out this curve on the sphere, right? So that's what derivatives of unit vectors give us, is they give us direction of change together with the rate of change, okay? And so um, what we can do is thinking of a generic curve, we can um, compute the unit tangent vector to this curve. So suppose this is the curve f of s, where s is that parameter that we uh, introduced last in the last video, where um, it uh, parameterizes the curve in such a way that for every unit of um, that the parameter changes, you trace out that much of arc length. Okay? We talked about how derivative with respect to s of this thing uh, has norm 1. And so out on this curve, we've just got some unit vector at every point on the curve. And uh, this is called the unit tangent vector. And it's denoted with T of S. Okay, so the unit tangent vector bit. And so um, what we can do is we can just differentiate this unit tangent vector. And basically, the idea behind this is that you can take all these vectors here, and they're all going to be unit vectors. And you can just think of taking all those unit vectors and putting them onto the sphere, right? You just take them and you keep the same direction, but you just shift them all over to the sphere, okay? And so uh, this vector would be pointing sort of down like that. Uh, this vector would be pointing over like that and so on. And so you just take this vector and look at the change in direction of this vector, okay? And so intuitively speaking then, differentiating the unit tangent vector is going to tell us um, both the direction and the rate of change of um, the curve, right? The, um, the direction of change and the rate at which that direction changes, okay? And so you'll notice that in this case here, the curve is changing very quickly, and it's changing in this direction, right? 
in this region here, you'll notice that it's changing very slowly and it's changing in that direction. And so, the result of differentiating the unit tangent vector gives us those two pieces of information, direction of change of the curve and the rate at which that change is occurring. And so, um, we can uh, differentiate this thing. We know that, um, let's go ahead and consider the derivative of the unit tangent vector dotted with itself, okay? So this is the unit tangent vector, so obviously if we dot it with itself, it's just going to be 1. So we're taking the derivative of 1, which is obviously 0, and now we can differentiate this using the uh, product rule, which works for uh, dot products as well. And so this just becomes uh, t prime of s dotted with t of s plus t of s dotted with t prime of s. And the dot product is um, commutative, so you can switch the uh, order here, and we get 2 t prime of s dotted with t of s. Okay? And so what we notice then is that since this thing is equal to 0, that tells us that the um, derivative of the unit tangent vector is orthogonal to the tangent vector. Right? And so um, that direction orthogonal to the unit tangent vector is what's called the normal direction and I say the normal direction because there is under certain conditions there is a uniquely defined normal direction that we care about that is given to us through this differentiation process. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Anyway, so um, we can uh, given this normal direction, what we can do is we can rewrite the derivative of the unit tangent vector in the following way. We can write t prime of s as that normal direction, so this is obviously the direction of change of the unit tangent vector, times some scalar kappa of f of s. And so kappa is a scalar value called curvature, and it's, uh, po it's always positive. Um, assuming your curve is not a straight line. Okay, so this kappa is only defined when the curve is not a straight line. And obviously you have to be differentiable as well, but you know, we're assuming differentiability everywhere. So Okay, so this guy's only defined when f is not a straight line. And so um, what this looks like is we've got our curve here. And the unit tangent vector basically tells us the direction that the point would be moving. If you think of a point tracing out this curve, the unit tangent vector tells you the direction that that point is moving at some um, instant, right? And now, when we measure the rate of change of the unit tangent vector, what we're doing, like I said, is we're measuring two things, both the direction of change of the curve together with how quickly the curve is changing in that direction, right? And so, uh, that is the intuitive meaning of t prime of s. And like I said, we can think of um, t prime of s in those two terms. Kappa of s tells us the rate at which the curve is changing, and uh, n of s tells us the direction. And so, um, in this case, the curve is changing extremely rapidly, and so, the t prime of s is going to be large. This would be our unit normal vector, n of s. And then multiplying that by kappa, remember kappa is always positive, so it's going to have the same direction, stretches that thing out. And then over in this region here, obviously, it's much small, uh, the, the rate of change of the curve is a lot slower, and so we have our unit normal vector, n of s. But, uh, 
kappa is going to be much smaller because the curve is not changing direction very quickly. Okay. So once we have T of S and N of S, we can define something called the osculating plane. The osculating plane is just defined to be the span of the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. I'm not sure if it has one L or two Ls. I'll put two in there. So this thing is just a span of the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. And it's called the osculating plane because uh, there's an object called the osculating circle, which is uh, kind of important. The osculating circle is a circle which measures um, how much curvature the curve has at a given point. Okay, So you've got your curve here, and let's just assume that this curve is planar. It, the osculating circle can be defined for non-planar curves as well, but just for the sake of clarity, let's assume that this thing is planar. So it's perfectly flat here. Then the osculating circle at a given point is just a circle of a given radius such that that circle is tangent to the curve at that point. Okay, And so obviously, this osculating circle then gives us information about the amount of curvature for that point. For a high curvature area, the osculating circle is very small. And for an, a region like this, the osculating circle is going to be very large because you need a large radius in order to have a tangent circle to that point. right? And so um, the osculating circle lives in the osculating plane. Okay, so remember, osculating plane is you've got your unit tangent vector here and your unit normal vector, and you just take the span of those two vectors that gives you the osculating plane. Osculating circle then lives in that plane and kisses the curve. The oscillating circle is tangent to the curve at the given point. Okay, and so. We already discussed how the um, size of the osculating circle gives us information about the rate of curvature of the curve at that point, and it's related to that original kappa value. Remember that we had uh, the rate of change of the unit tangent vector is given by um, kappa of f of s times the unit normal vector, and this kappa of f of s actually has an interpretation in relation to this osculating circle. Okay? The radius of the osculating circle is given by the reciprocal um, 1 over kappa of f of s. radius is given by 1 over kappa of f of s, okay? just the, the curvature at that point on the curve. right? And so what we see is that when kappa is uh, very large, or in other words, when the rate of change of direction of the curve is rapid, the reciprocal is small, giving you a small radius of curvature for that oscillating circle. When kappa is small, meaning a low rate of change of the curve, the reciprocal obviously becomes very large, so you have a large radius. And then um, what we see is that that uh, kappa value basically measures, if you can think of the curve at a given point together with its osculating circle at a given point. And now that we have this osculating circle, let's just go ahead and forget about the curve for a moment. Let's go ahead and just think about this unit tangent vector, T of S. That curvature value tells us the size of this osculating circle and the size of the osculating circle. You can think of, at this point, the unit tangent vector is going to be wrapping around the circle. And so obviously the smaller the circle, the more rapidly the unit tangent vector is going to be turning at that point. Right. So that's um, the interpretation of the kappa 
value, the, the curvature value. Okay, um, and now let's go and talk about the binormal vector. We'll talk about what the interpretation of that is. The binormal vector is just given by T of S cross N of S. And uh, this binormal vector is going to be a unit vector orthogonal to the osculating plane. Okay, so we've got our curve here. And this point right here, we can, we can compute the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. Remember that the osculating plane is the span of those two. And now, the uh, binormal vector is going to be the cross product of these two. Ah, I drew this kind of bad. Well, that's OK. So that's T of S. This is N of S. So it's going to be uh, T of S cross N of S. So in this picture, it points down, actually, which is fine. Um, and so this binormal vector, remember, like I said at the beginning, the reason we like unit vectors is because when we differentiate a unit vector, it tells us the direction of change and the rate of change uh, for, for something. And so in this case, we've got this binormal vector. I'm going to gesture with my hand on top, even though in this diagram the binormal vector is pointing downward. The binormal vector is always orthogonal to the osculating plane. And so um, this osculating plane sort of turns around as it as the curve gets traced out, right? And so if you differentiate the binormal vector, what you get is uh, the rate of rotation of the osculating plane about the tangent line to the curve, OK? So let's go ahead and draw this in our diagram here. We've got this tangent line through the unit tangent vector. And like I said, that osculating plane, as the curve gets traced out, the osculating plane curves around and sort of um, you know, changes angle like this. And so when you differentiate B of S, then what happens is that B of S measures the rate of rotation of the osculating plane around the tangent line to the curve. Okay? And this is then related to the torsion of the curve. The torsion of the curve uh, describes the rate at which the curve is trying to twist out of the osculating plane. And so um, in a planar curve, the torsion will be zero because it's not twisting out at all. But for a, a curve that's out in space like this, you sh or often you'll have some non-zero torsion, and that describes the rate at which I think it's twisting out of the plane. So that's uh, the basic sort of building blocks of differential geometry of curves is tangent vectors describe the direction of the motion along the curve. Normal vectors describe the direction that the curve changes. And the binormal vector helps in describing the rate at which the curve is twisting out of the osculating plane. And so we'll talk about some consequences of all these definitions in another video.